started blood and blood spatter and yet here we are bringing it to a close this will be the uh, final lecture for uh, blood and blood spatter and uh, in this particular um, lecture it's kind of like an expansion of some of the other things that we've talked about or that you would have seen in videos or uh, seen in certain cases but uh, it gives you a, a bit more again emphasis on blood direction and origin and uh, we get to see a little intro into stringing and how they would run those calculations um, we talk a bit about angles of impact and uh, some tools that uh, crime scene investigators would have for um, you know identifying uh, blood or locating blood at a crime scene so uh, just to review real quickly, um, you may recall that in the last lecture, we looked at the six patterns of blood spatter. And while, you know, if you were to close your eyes right now, you might not be able to rattle them all off. If you see them in a list like this, you should be at a spot where you're comfortable describing a little bit about them. So if we talk about a passive fall, I hope that you kind of have some, some thoughts coming to mind, maybe even some pictures that I've shown you of like, you know, the cohesive force trying to keep the blood together. And if it gravity pulls it down and it, and it falls to the Earth's surface at about a 90 degree angle, you wind up with that pretty circular drop. Um, if I said, oh, okay, and what might form when it hits, you know, depending on the surface, uh, things like spikes and satellites and uh, what they would be and how they would form, uh, those should be things that uh, if you're not familiar with, you want to refer back to the last lecture. Um, gushes or arterial spurts, if I were to just ask you about like, you know, the driving mechanism for that, you know, you should know that would be when a pretty substantial injury has occurred and uh, the heart is really what drives those large gushes or uh, blasts of blood, sometimes high up on walls or even ceilings. Um, splashes, you know, that's the one that we've been describing as an exclamation point. We'll look more at those in a bit and we'll see that they're great for giving direction and origin. Smears like it sounds, you know, I mean, some of the pictures that I've found are like very obvious, like a handprint that clearly has smeared, um, you know, really anything that was bleeding. Say someone had a, a gunshot wound to the shoulder and a, a you know, a, a shoulder was soaked in blood and they brushed up against a wall. It wouldn't be obvious to see or, you know, to know exactly what that was, but we could still describe that as a smear. Trails, that can be kind of like the hodgepodge. Remember, basically when we talk about a trail and blood spatter, it just means that you could track where someone went from point A to point B. And while that occurred, they may leave behind any combination of these other five um, blood spatter patterns. And uh, pools, if uh, poolings occurred, like in the picture here, we see some pooling and it looks like some other spatter as well. That would be where some, um, you know, consistent bleeding or uh, letting has occurred in a stationary spot for some time. And uh, a lot of blood is built up in one location. So, um, you know, again, if you feel like, oh, yeah, 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 that's review. Fantastic. If you feel like this is the first time you've ever heard those or it's uh, kind of rough sledding, um, you know, again, please go back and uh, refer to uh, our second lecture of uh, Blood and Blood Spatter. So here, what we see on the left, that's going to be a splash. And uh, while we don't have a full-on exclamation point, this is almost like an exclamation point, but rather than like a satellite, where the blood actually kind of like broke free in the front for like the dot of the exclamation point. It's kind of like a spike or a spine where uh, the cohesive force appears to have kept that intact after that impact. So this end here on the right, um, that would be what's called the tail. And it seems kind of weird. I mean, you know, if you think of a dog running, um, you know, it's tails behind it. Um, with blood and blood spatter, when you get a splash, the uh, blood droplet was traveling towards its tail and uh, we can tell if you think about what had happened here imagine this blood you know you've got c and you've got a for like uh both our um you know x and y axis on this um if you look at like the blood coming in at the picture on the left it came in from left to right so when the blood hit here on the far left it was still pushing almost kind of like a little mini 
tidal wave, if you will, um, of um, blood that kind of made its way to the right. And there can be enough force of the blood on that droplet, like within the droplet, that some of that blood actually gets forced forward so much that it ejects out and causes the dot in front, which would really be almost like a little satellite. But, um, you know, I don't want you to think like, oh, well, then is this a passive fall? I would refer to this as a uh, splash. So uh, the other end is referred to as the head. And uh, again, the blood droplet is traveling towards its tail, which sort of seems kind of counterintuitive a bit. On the right here, what we see is uh, this is supposed to be all these little red ovals, these elongated droplets. Um, that tells me that it didn't hit at a 90 degree angle. It must have been a lower angle. And if you look here, there's like lines going through all of them. If you had a bunch of splashes on the floor and you drew a line through the longitudinal axis, where all those lines intersect, so you've got this kind of like big green plus sign or cross here on our X and Y, and then this sort of circle around there almost looks like a gun scope or something. In that circle where all those lines converge or they come together, that would be the point of origin. In other words, if all this spatter is out here and somebody ran lines through all these droplets, you can say, okay, well, where those lines intersect, that's going to be the point of origin or where the bleeding actually took place. Later on, we'll see that we can actually run a calculation and figure out where above the ground, like in a third dimension, um, that that bloodletting would have occurred. So did it happen from, you know, a foot off the floor or six feet off the floor? Because that can make a huge difference, right? I mean, if someone's laying on the ground in a defensive posture versus, you know, um, trying to come at somebody with maybe an arm over their head or something, um, all those things can be determined from calculation with uh, blood spatter. So we've got a picture on the left. And I get that that's not a real picture. It's just kind of like a little uh, clip arty picture there. But if I said, okay, you know, look at what we've got there. Can you tell me what direction that blood was traveling? So at first, a lot of kids might think, all right, well, you know, the blood must be traveling down to the bottom left because that's the bigger end. Um, no. Remember, blood travels towards its tail. So here would be the direction of travel. All this thin air blood here at the tail, that's because when the blood hit the force, or excuse me, hit the surface, the force pushed some of that blood forward, and it looks like here, cohesion one, and you didn't actually get a, a droplet out in front to make like almost more of a true exclamation point. Um, take a look at this picture on the right. We see some, um, you know, uh, splashes where if you look at like this one here that I'm circling, um, it actually does have the satellite in front. And notice how much darker it is here towards the tail. That's because when this blood droplet hit, all that blood pushed forward. So if you've got more blood pushing towards the tail, it makes sense that it'd be thicker because there's more blood and therefore it's going to be darker. So if you really look at any of these uh, splashes on the right hand side here, you've got the tail and uh, you know some of them actually have a little satellite in front and they're all going to be darker towards the tail and that's because that was the direction that the blood was moving and it got pushed and it sort of flowed thicker into that area. So not the clearest picture here I could find, but sorry about that. Uh, hopefully you can still get some decent information from it. On the left, this is where we've got basically like a 90 degree angle. And notice that that's saying, hey, this would be a pretty circular type drop. Um, we've got some spikes and spines and little satellites and all, but notice that this guy here, this is saying this blood came in at a nine, or excuse me, a non or a lesser than 90 degree angle. And uh, the lower that angle gets, the more elongated, the more stretched, the more oval-like um, your blood droplet's going to be. So straight down, I expect it to be pretty darn circular. Less than 90 degrees, I expect it to be more elongated. A lot less than 90 degrees, even more elongated yet. And again, you know, we see this big blue arrow here on the right telling us, remember, blood chases towards its tail. And notice how it's even darker here towards the tail. Not quite a true satellite uh, pushed off towards the front there, but uh, hopefully this is starting to look a little bit more familiar. So uh, I, I'm not going to post this video clip. Um, perhaps you've heard of the program Dexter. Uh, it was a pretty successful series, and uh, it shows a, uh, a lot of blood and blood spatter in that uh, program. Uh, there's a clip 
where uh, they do what's referred to as stringing. Uh, I didn't want to put it in the lecture here, though, because sometimes YouTube flags things that were, you know, on TV or copyright infringements or something. So I'm going to try to dump it on my YouTube channel solo uh, so you can watch it that way and everybody can get the credit for whoever made it. But um, I didn't want to make this lecture and then have it crash. So uh, anyways, uh, look for that if you're curious to see um, a Dexter clip where they show what's referred to as blood stringing. And in blood stringing, uh, what they do is, I mean, as the name suggests, they run strings and uh, all these would show the point of convergence in 3D. So if you look at this, what you've got is all this blood spatter on the wall and they've ran a calculation so they knew the angle that it must have hit and they ran the string off at each of those and they wound up with a spot in space where they all converged. Um, I actually had the privilege of working with the Michigan State Police Department and see how they do some of this blood and blood spatter. And uh, it is awesome, but it's also very, very time consuming. Every single one of these strings that needs to be ran, um, they have to run the calculation off of, set up the protractor, run the string, tie it off, repeat. And uh, the more times you do that, the more accurate your information is. And they're usually after the most accurate information they can get, so it can be uh, relatively time consuming. So if you look at this, uh, we're not going to get into the calculations of all this. But if you do run a relatively simple calculation of um, width and length of the uh, blood droplet that you have or the, the spatter pattern that you have, you can wind up with an angle. And then again, running that angle off of that blood droplet runs that string off to a location in space. And you continuously do that and you find that all those strings meet up in one spot. That shows you in three dimensions, not just where at in the room, but how far above the floor that that bloodletting actually occurred. So uh, pretty interesting stuff. And uh, if that's something that you're curious about, simple Google search will give you oodles of information. So this, for some reason, seems to be one of those things that if I write it in words, um, it gets kind of confusing. But if I just sort of talk about it, it's not so bad. But um, what I'm getting at here is... In a way, I would say this is kind of common sense. Um, imagine if I had two eggs, uncooked eggs, raw eggs, and I drop one on my kitchen floor a foot above the floor. So, you know, I kind of bend over and I drop the egg a foot above the floor and it cracks and it makes a mess. And I'm like, oh, that was curious. And I take another uncooked egg and I stand up on a chair and I lift the egg up over my head and I let go. So it falls from the floor at a much higher height and hits the ground. What do you think it would look like in comparison to the other egg that was only a foot off the floor? It's going to be a lot bigger mess, right? So what we're getting at here is just as the increase of diameter happens, that tells us or it's indicative of an increase in height from which the bloodletting occurred. Or maybe another way of saying that is, as blood falls from a higher height, it's going to have a bigger diameter or a bigger drop. So like, look at the very bottom here, right? That's a relatively small drop. That's supposed to be from, you know, it's a passive fall. Okay, so it fell six inches to the ground and made that droplet. This up here is supposed to represent seven feet. What's the difference? They look pretty similar, right? Except the diameter or, you know, the size of the circle is larger. Why? Well, because as it fell from a higher height, gathered more speed, hit with more force, left a larger mark. So uh, just again, you know, keep that in mind. There's a, a proportional relationship there. The farther it falls, the bigger the droplet would be. The reverse of that is, of course, the less it falls, the smaller the droplet would be. So here's a, a picture that should kind of make some sense. We've got uh, an impact at 10 degrees, an impact at 30 degrees, an impact at 40 degrees, and an impact at 90 degrees. So if you jump all the way over to the 90 degree, that was like one of the first ones we talked about with passive falls, right? And we said that if blood falls at 90 degrees, basically straight down, you're going to, oops, you're basically going to get a circular droplet. And then the less close to 90 or maybe the, the the lesser the angle or the smaller the angle gets the more it comes in at an angle rather than just nice and straight down um, you're going to expect that blood droplet to be more elongated or more stretched so uh, you know we've 
seen this before, but this is just kind of one little chart that I found that I thought uh, sort of put it all together nicely. Woof, the heck's going on here? Well, uh, without seeing this, it just kind of looks eerie, but um, I've seen this before. And uh, when I found it, this was uh, where investigators had determined to cover up. Uh, if we were to turn on the lights, just regular light here, not under black light, it looks like a relatively clean shower in a hotel. Um, what had happened here is that somebody did a cleanup and they were trying to hide the fact that there was blood all over this shower. So detecting blood sometimes just by looking around real closely can be tricky because a lot of times people try to cover things up and they may use certain cleansers or cleaners or a lot of elbow grease to try to clean up the fact that there was a lot of blood and they're trying to hide that fact. So there's this chemical that we saw in uh, some of the videos from before called luminol. And, you know, luminol sounds like luminous or something that's bright. Uh, that's what luminol does. Um, luminol is used to detect blood. Um, however, I will say that luminol can also glow in the presence of other things besides blood. So that can sometimes be a concern. There are a few things that can set it off besides blood. Um, another thing is that the interaction between the hemoglobin, remember you might remember that's what gives blood its reddish color, there's iron in there, um, it's going to react with the luminal and it generates light, but that reaction only lasts for about 30 seconds. So this is definitely something that investigators would want to have um, cameras set up prior to spraying the area that they're looking at or, you know, they suspect that maybe blood would be there because, um, you know, if it just runs its reaction and that's that and then they're just going off of their word rather than well-documented information um it's just uh, not as credible so uh luminol pretty magical stuff check this out so here's a picture of where um there was a cleanup and uh, we see the picture on the left doesn't look like much of anything. Almost looks like a regular old classroom or something, right? It looks like we got a whiteboard up here with some dry erase markers or something. I don't know. I can't really tell from the picture. It appears to be relatively clean carpeting and wall, but uh, this would be all cleanup. <clears throat> Excuse me. On the right. So this is one picture and then they've just kind of superimposed the filter after they sprayed all this bright glow here and it looks almost like footprints walking out that must have had blood on them or something else that would have triggered the luminol. Um, clearly something though had been covered up. Can we say conclusively that there was blood all in this area and that then somebody had uh, cleaned it up? No, but you know some more investigation could probably get us to that point and it's certainly suspicious that somebody would have spent that much time cleaning something up and a chemical used to determine that blood was there is glowing like crazy. So when investigators find something like that, uh, they're, they're going to first have to kind of go through these steps. And um, like when I got to work with and watch the MSP, the Michigan State Police Department, go through some of their um, blood and blood spatter um, techniques, one of the things that I noticed the investigator kept saying was, well, we appeared to see reddish brown, brown fluid that um, appeared to look like blood. And uh, when we tested the reddish brown fluid that appeared to look like blood, you know, after a while you keep hearing reddish brown fluid that appeared to look like blood or reddish brown marking that appeared to look like blood. It was like, hey, what, what's going on? And they're like, look, we're very, very careful not to just come out and say something's blood because the way that the legal system works is if you get a lawyer and they're on the defensive and they say, oh, so you went in knowing it was blood. No, I didn't know it was blood. Oh, you assumed it was blood. Yeah, I assumed. Oh, do you always make assumptions? And they can start to rip things down. So before they can actually make the determination, hey, this was blood, they're going to want to do some steps. First, ask, is it blood? And uh, next, run a question, you know, is it human blood? And then three, determine, is it blood? And there's a test called a Castle Myers test that can actually be done pretty quickly to determine if it is blood. And then moving forward in the investigation there, they can say, yeah, it was blood. But uh, they're going to want to make sure, again, is it even blood? Is it human? And what type of blood is it? And then that way they can move forward. And if they follow proper protocol, everything just looks a lot more credible. So that wraps up our last lecture for um, 
Blood and Blood Spatter. I would encourage you to go and watch that uh, Dexter clip. I think it's awesome. If you've got any question concerns from this, uh, please let me know. And I look to also upload some uh, demos of uh, food coloring blood droplets that uh, maybe we can make some spatter in real time. Got any questions? Let me know. Uh, be safe and uh, thanks for watching.